How are you, my friend? Todo bien. Muy bien, ¿y tú? Muy bien, gracias. You know, thanks for um, staying up. Uh, we're staying in the office a little bit later than normal, but um, and we're looking forward to tasting the wines. <clears throat> Do you want to? Right now, we have the Quintessa out. Is that okay? That's totally yeah. fine. That's yeah. what we want to taste today. <laughs> we have. We actually have the uh, eighteen, seventeen, and sixteen. I'm so glad that you guys have three different vintages because that's going to yeah. allow us to expand a little bit in the conversation and. Um, and talk about farming, which I think is something that is becoming more and more important for us and, uh, and, and, uh, and for what we're trying to do. And also a little bit talking about uh, the history, uh, what we have learned from years past, the vision of the founders, the estate model, as I mentioned to you, James, I think that we're looking for uh, your insight on that because obviously you're very familiar with that. And as you know, that's not the biggest uh, or the most popular model in the new world. And I think it's so important to have certain traditions, certain culture, and try to bring that to important regions like Napa uh, yeah. to, in order to establish those classics in the, in the area. So I think those are elements that it's very important for us to discuss and to make the point that we are very much driven for those type of uh, mo for that model and for that vision started with the with Augustine and Valeria many many years ago. But also, you're talking about uh, biodynamics, uh, which essentially was a movement that um, started that was started by Steiner to um, canonize concepts and uh, and traditions of um, let's say. Uh, farmers uh, in um, the Austrian-Hungarian Empire. And uh, it was uh, also something to maintain these traditions uh, during the industrialization of Europe. So, and so what you're saying is also interesting. I hadn't thought about it, but you have Napa, whose traditions are pr at currently, there's still so many people following traditions started in the 60s and 70s and um, canonized by Davis. Uh, and basically a lot of it was based on industrialized um, agriculture and yeah. even silly things like row, spa uh, row spacing based on using common um, American tractors. So right. that's really cool. You know, I'm, it's exciting to see what you guys are doing and also at the same time, see a few others in Napa and in California and the U.S. who are um, doing, you know, who are working along the same lines with you. Why do you think what, you know, aside from all the like philosophical, the problem is a lot of times people uh, politicize uh, biodynamics and, uh, and they generalize uh, people who don't believe in it and people who uh, do sort of trying to make it black and white, almost like a war. But for you, just like if we took away the politics, what is what do you think biodynamics does uh, for you as farmers, and what does it do for you as winemakers? Correct. I, I will. Before we start, I mean, and uh, uh, just what you said, uh, James. The purpose of the lectures of Steiner mm -hmm. in 1923 mm -hmm. was because the industrialization, you're very right. But the thought of the time was that because of this industrialization of agriculture, mm -hmm. the quality of protein is gonna diminish its power. And that diminish of power is gonna create a problem with synapses. Ah. And with a problem with synapses, we're gonna have a moral crisis in society. Well, I never, I, I, unfortunately, I have the books I read were in French. So <laughs> my French wasn't up to speed, but I never heard the one about synapses, you know, DNA synapses and, um, and just thinking. Wow. The, and the quality of thinking is going to be diminished. Let you tell me, if it, isn't that what's going on? I mean, it's, yeah, it's, you know, it's like scaring, starting to sweat. You know, it's, that's not. 
it's Absolutely. great. It, it, it was yeah. that, that was the interesting yeah. thing. And uh, so so going to your question, I mean, let me let me tell you what I think in terms of farming, and, and I'm sure Rebecca, please say you you. you let me know what you think about farming and, and, and winemaking, but definitely for the opposers or people that do not accept biodynamics or see it as a black and white, only shows me that this has not been enough thought on the process because actually the whole purpose of biodynamics is to keep evolving and keep adapting the process to your own sites. The whole purpose as well is to get into the understanding or the deep understanding of your own piece of property or your own estate. So that's why it fits so well, the estate model with a singular way of practicing agriculture. It's not that we have a section for biodynamics, a section for organics and a section for convention. It doesn't make any sense because at the very end, the whole purpose is you manage the property as a whole, as a single organism and that you accept and try to understand the matrix of nature inside it. And you try to articulate those relationships as best as you can. And that's the definition. Well, in a sense, that's a definition in French of terroir and also for us, ecosystem. Correct. And terroir has an extra component. Man you and women. Yes. <laughs> no, I think for biodynamics, I think that the problem, from, from my perspective, when people say, I don't believe it, or it's a hoax, some of it has been a communication problem because it, it doesn't need to, it's not, it doesn't need to be a religion or a full, you don't have to accept it It in some sort of like epiphany way. It, it's fundamentally a way to understand your connectivity to your connectivity to the place the vine's connectivity to the ground and their experience and to think about it. And so it, it works perfectly with an estate model because it, and as a winemaker and wine growing, it, it's exactly what you want. You don't want there to be a separation between the vineyard and the winery. It, it, it helps us understand more in depth as well. You know, the, now that we have been spending more time in the vineyards, uh, James, uh, because of obvious reasons, we have not been able to travel. So we have been much more methodical in our way of walking the property and understanding and seeing the cycles much more in depth. It's, it's amazing how you start seeing those connections. Now, when you start articulating that with certain basic techniques, like uh, we were, we have been, and, and actually I'm trying to mimic the look of the Simone and Search. I don't know if you get the chance to, Very nice. to, to, to see that. But uh, uh, when you go talk with people that really mastered their task, like the master pruners that they are, and we have been working with them for the last three years, and when you start meeting these people that doesn't have anything to do with biodynamics, but their way of thinking, it's absolutely in line with yeah, what we're trying to do. Absolutely. They, you know, I was talking with Marco in a, one of our sessions, and he was looking at me and she said, Rodrigo, to prune the vine, you need to feel like the vine. You need to understand how it grow, wants to grow. And then he pointed and like, look at your workers. Your workers are not workers of the field. They're sculptures. They're sculpturing your vines in order to get what you want. It was remarkable. And, and honestly, those moments that when you talk with high, really high level people of the wine industry that they really understand and they have seen it all. And they give you such a simple anal analogy is when you start like, boom, you start connecting everything and everything is related. So biodynamics for us is a vehicle as well in order to understand all these individual tasks that are completely articulated in a property or in a state like this. So the re well, I guess the a question and this is sort of rhetorical because I have my own ideas about it, but I'd like to get your ideas. But people always ask, can you taste the difference in the wine? Absolutely, yes. But it's, a bit, again, it's, a, it's, it's not a specific taste. But when you see a property that has all the different colors and exposures and, and soil types and all that, and you realize, 
what's the end product. And you can see that thread or that line of thought. You, I think that you can definitely understand why biodynamics is so important. Maybe you cannot taste it literally, but you can taste it, taste it in a much more psychological way in the wine. You know that how those elements are put together and start giving a completely different dimension to the wine that you're trying to make, which, by the way, doesn't follow the rules of the region necessarily. I think that it follows the rules of the estate, of the property where you're working on. And I think that's the beauty of it because you start developing your own personality that you don't need to follow anybody. You're just who you are. And I think that is so important for what we do, James, because the more that you feel the pressures from the styles or the markets that you tend to go and see what's happening. But uh, I think that there's very little recognition about what you can do by your own based on the current conditions that you have in your own estate. Exactly. What, but in a way, what you're talking about is really um, old world philosophies and winemaking. And of course, again, as we said, that's what Steiner tried to actually, uh, well, actually he did in, in um, his writings, actually putting it down on paper. But it's really what... Um, it's generational. It's what um, a grandfather transmits to his um, uh, grandson or his uh, son um, over the years uh, working in their cellar in their vineyards. And of course, that's something that uh, Europeans are more used to because they have a much longer history. So um, it's just interesting. Uh, there's less of that in other parts of the world, but it's now you know, I'm 62, so I've seen, you know, I've seen the sons take over from the parents and you s actually see that now happening, which is exciting. I think that you, that biodynamic wine does have more energy. Um, mm. And I don't know if it's the one, if it's biodynamics itself, or if it's the way that people who work in biodynamics have to understand their place, their, their property, understand their property and express mm. it in a very true and individualistic way. Um, but do you think that you can taste it? To really get the full um, experience, we could call it, then you need to actually uh, drink the wine in context. Like, so for me, when I rate a wine and I give you a high score and then I see, for example, Demeter, then I'm like, whoa, how cool. Or like, you know, my wine of the year, of course you do from um, Piero and Chisa de la Roqueta uh, Chacra from Argentina, that's biodynamic. So for me, it's just, an, it's, for me, it just makes me really happy. And, and it's such an added value to me. It's something that makes me feel good as a, a wine critic, but more so as a wine lover that, wow, this is also biodynamic and what it means to the ecosystem, the environment. It's just, a better wine for me. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Even though if I just took it, you know, black and white, this is a, you know, 100 point wine, 98 point, you know, whatever. But emotionally, it means a lot to me because I know what it means to agriculture. And like you say, sort of connecting all the dots and what it means to the um, winemaker or owner. So yeah. that's, you know, that's how I look at it. And, and also the component of ageability, James, that, that is so remote for, for us in the new world that for many years we were not even believers because we didn't have it. But now that you're working on a vineyard, that you're trying to think in ahead 40, 50 years and you're trying to make it age with grace. And what yes. is necessary to get all that? Uh, and you realize this is the farming technique that is going to take me there. I don't see it possible with any other farming techniques because at the very end, you're creating so much stress to the vine with any other techniques that, that you, it's not going to make it through its career. So I think those elements are so important that we can be able to think ahead and think long term because we may be always trying to do our best in the present and that current vintage, et cetera. But if we think large and we think big and we think really how we should be in terms of a state and how we make it transcend to uh, generations it's very important to 
build that foundation so that your vines last for long. That's it. And this is, that's really an important point, which I realized a few years ago when I was at, went to Gergich. Yeah. And they have some biodynamics, but I'm um, also organics um, in Viticol. They, you know, they adhere to that and they believe in it. And they, he just explained it. He goes, James, look at those vines. Though he goes, you see our vines? And I go, yeah. He goes, do you see? They're really, sm they're really small. I go, how old are those? Oh, those are um, 30 years old. And then I go, oh, those must be really these other vines here. He goes, no, no, no. Those are like 10 years old. They're huge because they've been just fertilized and yeah. huge yields. He goes, exactly. they're going to die because they've been yeah. so stressed. It's like the guy in the gym that's just been in, on steroids for Absolutely. years. Absolutely. It's going to be. That's what, yeah, we, our goal is to, you know, the, in, the average in the, in the valley is pulling out vines like at 20 years old. It's so weird. In the old world, like Chateau Latour doesn't even use the grapes from their vines that are less than 12 years old, yeah. you know, that goes into the second wine. Yeah. So he, he, so the, the fact is through, bio, especially in Napa in biodynamics, you can, you can have vines at age 40, 50 years, like in the old world, you don't have to replant. Think what it does to everything, to the ecosystem. Totally. Totally. That is the true establishment. That's a true adaptability. That's when you start expressing true sense of place. And, and, and yes. we were talking earlier today with Rebecca about appellations and sub-appellations that, that doesn't feel that they mean much because at the very end, the style dominates over the quality of the territory. And yes. I think at a certain point, we need to shift that. We need to make it happen. And, and that's where the soils are important. The farming techniques are important. Everything counts, but everything needs to be deeply understood and for that, you need time, you need experience, you need a little bit of wisdom that we're trying to create and that backtrack information that we're going to utilize in, in years to come. But without it, how can you do it? I mean, it's not just a technique that you apply it in every single place. It needs to be deep. And the wines need to taste different. They need to show its own character and its own personality. If not, we're failing. Uh, and and I think that's what's so important to to reinforce. Do you think uh, again, sort of a um, rhetorical question, but 2018 um, is a vintage that uh, we've tasted probably 700 wines. It really shows the the wines show lots of differences, like uh, mount, mountain vineyards show mountain character. Rockford shows it's more sort of dusty. Um, slightly richer character and softer tannins. It seems that, uh, how did you find the 2018 vintage? Oh, I mean, it was, oh, it was incredibly even. And I think it's a, it was such a long harvest season. So there weren't any of those heat waves. It was almost the opposite of 2017. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, it, it was sort of, it's atypical for Napa to be able to make all of those harvest decisions when you want to make them all precisely. Um, and so I think that 2018, for me, it's one of my favorite vintages. It was one of my favorite harvests. Um, and I, I, I could see it being a vintage that will, for what we saw at Quintessa with all of the diversity we have, where we have different soil types, we have different elevations, we have different aspects. 2018 was one of those years where every single one of those different sub terroirs, different units on the property, let us know what they needed. We had time to listen to them and to react and to steward them through that. And each part of the property shown. So if you think of Quintessa as this microcosm of Napa Valley, of having these differences of terroir units, if what we saw here is what the Valley saw, then I would see 2018 being a vintage where I mean, that our white soils shown the um, kind of the the volcanic and clay mixtures of our um, high iron kind of very uh, kind of like a diamond mountain type terroir on yeah. our high point of our property that was excellent. Um, the part of the property that's the alluvial fan also shown. So I, I, 2018 was just that a joyous um, vintage for a winemaker. Tell me, um, tell me how 18 the only um, uh, 
possible negative with 18 from what I understand from a, a number of other um, vineyardists and winemakers was that uh, if you didn't, that you could have had issues with um, overproduction yeah. in the vineyard. If you were, yeah. And then if you didn't listen, so it was the 20, it, 2018 was one of those years, right, where there was adequate water, the vines set a good amount of crop. And if you saw that and you said, well, this is my opportunity to push it, or I, I can, I'm going to get everything I can in terms of tonnage and didn't actually listen or really, or understand what's happening below ground, understand what's happening, what your real terroir is, what the real conditions are, then it would be very tempting to have left too much fruit. And I think that the danger in a vintage like 2018 is having a wine that doesn't have density. Exactly. And we found that in a number of wines, not really the, let's say, top winemakers like yourselves, but um, in a, a number, you know, a lot of wines that, you know, let's say more uh, commercial or um, not the top names that I consider top vineyard people as well. And so that was just interesting that that what potentially could have been like the vintage of all time. But again, humans made the wrong decision. Hey, so, like, a, like Alan used to say, human stupidity is a very important variable in farming. <laughs> <laughs> as we see every day <laughs> yeah <laughs> so but as you know that's the other thing that uh, as Rebecca was saying I remember when we were looking at at pits early in the season uh, and James you see the canopies thriving and everything growing great and you see the soils and the root systems and you can tell that this is going to be the trick of this harvest because you can see the root systems and how the, the, the soils were getting dry and you can tell that they were overproducing and they were not going to be able to carry through all the season. So that was a key moment in time where we took action immediately in order to counterbalance the optimism and try to be really accurate with what the vine could carry. I think that's where we sometimes miss it out, that we see good weather out there and we feel that's all what we need, not necessarily. And I think we need to project the dryness of the season, if it was moderate, but the dryness of the season doesn't allow you to get to the final or to the final sprint with enough energy. And it was longer too. So maybe people weren't used to that either. And then you had bigger crops. So then to get it, uh, also people like to pick really late, um, not necessarily you, but then that elongated the um, growing season as well. Just waiting, okay, yeah, I'm going to get, you know, 15 potential alcohol and waiting. <laughs> yeah, as a winemaker, if you're stuck on, stuck on a, your harvest decisions being based off of a number, saying I can't yeah. pick until 25 bricks, well, 2018, things tasted great at 24 at 25 like you, you yeah and maybe this is back again to this biodynamics that which forces you to think about your particular conditions How and cool. so those are the conditions of your estate and then there are the conditions of that year and those are different the you know we take numbers we take harvest maturity but that's not what we put that's not the picking decision this is the more we we learn about age on the you know the the eldest vines are from uh, 1990, and uh, so they're almost on 30 years, 30 years already. Oh. Um, James, the older they get, the less sugar they need to taste right. And I think that's the other factor of ageability that we need to understand and allow it to happen, that the metabolisms start getting slower, just like us, and yeah. that you don't need that amount of sugar to uh, be fully ripe and get the flavors that you're looking at. And I think that is a phenomenal process because not only for making wine, it's that you can relate to your, to your life as well, that you need, start needing yeah. less things and you thrive in other things. And I think that is so interesting to use those analogies because it helps you understand a lot better. And without the experience and having certain level of maturity and cruising through the different stages, like having a vineyard that is old. And 
our personal experiences that were not new to this, I think they're starting to connect all the elements that are there in order to make and to truly understand what is all this about. Let's, Aaron, let's <laughs> taste the, uh, the 18 and maybe talk a little bit about how it all came out. I think this is one of the best wines you've ever made. There's really not, uh, there's not any of that over ripeness or ripeness in the, let's say old style, old school Napa style. It's so complex with so many more, uh, let's say uh, forest bark, you know, sort of autumnal sort of character in the nose, which is, and even blue fruits, there's blue fruits, but it's really complex like that, like really the soil, like this, the French say, sous bois, you know, forest floor. Red has been becoming one of our favorite aromatics to get because that's the other thing, the flashy fruit start being more subtle and you yeah. start getting a lot of more the earthiness. And yeah. that's exactly what we want in a wine that we want to make it transcend. Exactly. 2018 for me, it was my fourth full season working with this property, working with the wine. And so building on the three years prior to it, um, we had the opportunity to make some uh, changes in the winery to better match the vineyard. And I think that this is very gratifying to see that I, for me, this wine reflects that understanding. So we have a lot more, we uh, utilize and put in a lot of concrete tanks because those work really well with our property and particularly that white soil. And so you can see that, that length, that fineness to the tannin and the almost chalkiness. Uh, yeah, texture. I get it. It's, um, I agree that chalkiness texture, which, you know, also what you can also say dusty, mm -hmm. but it's that same texture to it. And, you know, I really like that. And then it goes soft and creamy. And it's very round, but not round in that style that many Napa ha wines have, where, where it's this sort of ripe fruit making it round, you know, like sugar coated tannins. Not at all. This is really the real tannin texture. You know, for many years, the, the term phenolics was considered not good and, and then we the more that we work with it it's so crazy don't you yeah. think it was and it was associated like a shortness or, mm -hmm. or or aggressiveness and the more that we start understanding those and together with those those white soils that has for many years has been i will not call it a mystery but very hard to understand Totally, totally, and, and 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 once you start working them and understanding them in depth and seeing what you get in exchange, that chalkiness that completely erase from the wine the sweetness of the tannins that you were describing of, of some other areas, and and I think that having that chalkiness is kind of patrimonial from this property for many years misunderstood James for many many years and I think now what we have is a treasure that we are trying to really decipher them as best as we can in order to guarantee that we're going to have that chalkiness every single vintage. I think that also though uh, and I just had a flashback to a story I did it must have been around in the two th early 2000s for the wine spectator on Michel Roland and I came to Quintessa for one of his um, sessions doing the assemblage, blending the wines. It, he's a great blender, but it's so interesting to think back to how Quintessa was the wines. They were so different because they were more stylized. And in a way, when it's that stylized, it's difficult to um, let the terroir speak for itself, let the true character of the estate, you know, come out with how the tannin should be, the aromas, whatever. And I think that's something that I've seen, particularly in the last 10 years, since I left The Spectator and covering Napa, I can see so many more people just, you know, 
much more hands-off winemaking so you can see these distinctive differences in um, different areas of Napa. And it's very exciting because you realize how diverse Napa is, you know, and you finally make the connection. You go, hold on, I'm in Pritchard Hill. I'm up on this mountain and the wine tastes like, I don't know, pine needles. And there's yes. just conifers everywhere. Then I'm down in the hot area of, of Oakville or Rutherford and the wine has this rich character and almost dusty tile characters. And I think that that's really exciting. And then when you take it to here, then you're just adding energy and, and person that real personality, right? Totally. That's exactly, and that's a, you know, that's part of the conversations that we, we tend to forget. And, and now that we start working with a, as I mentioned to you before, James, starting to export Quintessa and trying to have yeah. a more international presence. And when you start talking with really savvy buyers like the uh, negociants and, and people yeah. that they have a very different perspective and they get totally surprised by this chalkiness. I mean, I was not expecting yeah. that. Well, this is what we have at Contessa. It's absolutely unique. And, and they start, they get very excited because first of all, it's a surprise. Secondly, they see that there's something special in that flavors. I agree. And that's, that's, and I think that that's exciting because it's not what you said in the beginning of the conversation. It's not based on uh, marketing or someone's palate or whatever. It's really just based on what you have and, and tradition and people who are used to drinking more traditional wines, or let's say even we could say old wines like yeah. Bordeaux, Negociant are drinking old wines all the time from the eighties or or 70s, even older. So these wines have that character to them. And we use different descriptors, whether you say handmade or whatever it is, but yeah. it's, you know, that's what's exciting about it. That's really, um, that's what I call personality. We have the 17 and 16. Yeah, we, we, we actually do now too. Oh, great. Okay, well, we could try them. And maybe just talk about um, how, you know, maybe the 18 is really marked by the balance and uh, complexity of the wine. And again, that beautiful texture, which I think you get from long maturation, right? Like in Europe. So that's really exciting. And then 17, let's try it. We know about the vintage, but we can... Let's taste it first. That has a little bit more of the like dried fruits and a little bit riper, which yeah. makes sense. 17 right. was, the, the, was a hot year. Yeah, it was a hot year and it was a year, I mean, almost in a way, like the opposite of 2018. Mm. It was, there was heat, there was acceleration. Um, it wasn't a, you know, yields were low. So it wasn't that you had, you didn't have vines that were overloaded. There was never, there was never that danger in 2017, mm -hmm. but you could have vines that couldn't respond correctly to those conditions, to that heat. Um, and so when, what I saw, what I learned in 2017 was the importance of the old vines, the importance of that vine age, of that understanding of your terroir, because the old vines were great. The alcohol is a little bit higher than um, 18, right? Yeah, it's warmer, a little bit. Um, I don't want to call it burn, but you can sense the alcohol at the end. Yeah, I mean, it's that that darker, yeah. that that hot year expression. Where you're seeing more of the depth. There's a lot for me. There's a lot of that chocolate characters. What dark chocolate characters? That marker of a warm Napa vintage. Do you guys use optical sorters? Yes. How much do you think optical sorting has um, changed the quality of um, wines in Napa? Well, we were using hand sorting before. So yeah. the optical sorting is, um, you know, better because it doesn't require people. You can do faster and the machine doesn't get tired. I like 
the optical sorting, not because what I'm looking for is absolute. I don't want to, it's not that I'm looking for everything to look like a blueberry or have everything be exactly the same. The optical sorter gives us the opportunity to set your conditions. So I can say I, this range is okay by me. Um, or I don't want those stems. I don't want those raisins depending on the year. And you can just change it depending on the year. Um, you know, 2018 hardly needed any sorting at all. Yeah. Was um, yeah. Important. We took one of the shortest out I mean, yeah. uh, and, and you know, it, it, going to your question, if I can, I can uh, say that I think optical sorters has is an amazing tool, but you can easily overdo it. Yeah. And I think that's another aspect of technology that we got to be very careful because it's so tempting. The same thing with 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 farming. There's a tendency to overdo it because you think it's better. Yeah. And then when you go back in time and you taste the wines and the wines, yeah, at the beginning they didn't have any edges and they were super round and soft and beautiful, but they don't age the way that we expected. What happened? And maybe we were needing the edges. We were needing the support of those phenolics, of those extra tannins here and there in order to carry through time. So I think it's a balance point. And I think that is kind of the very good discussion that we have had multiple times because in terms of like, okay, how much imperfection we're willing to tolerate because imperfection is so good. What's a, uh, that's, that's super interesting. I think that also, again, back to the human factor, uh, that, that's a big thing in, in, in America too, is that we're not afraid to try things sometimes too much. Let's try 16 because that for me, 16 is it's really interesting to try. I haven't had as many 16s against 18s yet, but that seems like uh, a good uh, comparison. Mm -hmm. But let's taste yeah. yours. Because again, this has more of the mushroom again, right away, just fresh mushrooms, like mushrooms growing on a um, tree. You know, like oyster mushrooms. Yeah. Just two days ago, I saw an oyster mushroom as big as my hand growing on a tree. Over here, so, yeah. Here at the at the estate. No, I was actually on the Sonoma coast, and I was just walking oh. my dog. And it our, the mushroom season right now is crazy. Nice. Yeah. And so you, it's a little bit riper, but. Mm -hmm still along the same lines where you're getting the uh and the maybe the tannins or that's what i found was that 16 uh in your case i think that the 18 is a little bit like more you know broader more character just uh just more melted together well the 16 is but it has a lot of structure it's a fantastic wine as well how do you how do you compare the two, Rebecca? I mean, I, I agree with you. I think 16 was one of my favorite vintages until 18 yeah. came along. I think that they, they're they both speaking yeah. at the same, the same language. They mm -hmm. both speak to me of harmony. What I see is an energetic, uh, the expression of an energetic vintage. Great energy, great harmony. But I don't know, maybe I'm, I'm too personal in this way. Um, with these wines is with 18, what I see is two more years of understanding. 16 to me, I, I agree that there's one, if there's a knot somewhere, there's one step higher in ripeness than 18, uh -huh. but also shows that purity. Now the expression of the 18 for me shows that, that precision, mm -hmm. that it's, 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 it has that level of higher brightness and less ripeness. I agree. Right. It has more elegance too. We had that freshness, the acidity, which is not usually something in Napa that we we don't usually get all the way to harvest with all of our natural acidity. What was the P, what's the pH then on the eighteen? Uh, the pH is three point six. Okay. Quintessa is pretty special in that this is a vineyard that keeps its natural acidity generally we're usually at like three, six, five, three, seven, yeah. um, in the finished wine without having to do there, there is not adjusted. Yeah. And what's the alcohol? Uh, 
um, the alcohol on the 16 is higher than the 18. Yeah. And what's so the, the 18, alcohol on the 18? Uh, the 18 is 14.5, really 14.4. Um, wow. So 14.5 on the label 14.4. And the 2016, if I remember, is I think it's 14.7. Yeah. That's a really good point about alcohols, so though. In general, in 18, we can say across the board, everything, just about everything has mm -hmm. lower alcohol unless unless people really push the ripeness on the, you know, they decided to leave the fruit out there a long time. Yeah. Which gives Help. them, which gives them nice drink, really beautiful drinkability where you taste them and whoa, I could drink this now, which is so nice to find. I'm curious if some people are going to freak out because they're used to really big wines. These are so balanced 18s. They're really the sort of wines that I, you know, love to drink. What do you think about balance, uh, James? Are you seeing more and more pursuit of that? I mean, uh, of course, you have a much broader pers perspective than Napa, but I, it feels to me that it's, it's a natural tendency looking for more and more balance and try to find the right, the right points for every individual region. I totally agree. I think that globally, people are looking for more balanced wines. And... Um, I attribute that also to a generational change where people where you have younger winemakers and um I don't I don't want to make you know make it into something it could be a fact that they're less market driven but no everyone has to sell their wines but I think that just in general people are looking for drinkability and um I think that's really good I I'm, I've always ad adhered to that because you know I spent so many years covering European wines for the Wine Spectator, particularly Italy. And Italy was always about making wines to drink with food. I mean, that's just, you know, it's stuff that we take for granted. But I think that in general, everywhere in the world is about uh, more drinkable wines. And, and I'm excited that Napa is, you know, is, is definitely that going that way as well. At Quintessa in particular, we, we are very excited about this, this stream of vintages, this vertical, 16, yeah. 17, 18, shows, I think, a very exciting progression and understanding of a deeper understanding of the estate. I agree. And uh, like I said, I think definitely the 18 is the best wine you've made when I look back at my scores. <clears throat> and so, and I think that it's so interesting that. Uh, in a lot of ways, you're doing less than you used to do. <laughs> you're doing more in that you're in the vineyards all the time. And like, just sort of, um, like you say, uh, taking care of the vines. And then in, in the winemaking, you can see a much softer hand. And, and it makes the wine so much more complex and like desirable. You know, they're sort of enchanting wines now. <clears throat> you want to, you know, spend time with them and get to know them. That's really Europe, like old Europe in a way. <clears throat> when I started in the 80s, I remember, you know, going to chateaus and tasting with people in their, you know, 60s and 70s then in the 80s. And it was, they were always talking about getting, they really knew their wines and their estates so personally. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. they were talking to them like, like, um, family members, you know, here, like they were talking about their family. So thank you so much for uh, the conversation. It was really amazing and uh, learned a lot. And it was really fun to share ideas. And I love it when you have conversations, when stuff just pops into your, you know what I mean? There was a good um, exchange of ideas and, and, uh, and hot, you know, really high and really understanding better of uh, what you guys are doing. And, and I, as you know, I, I always came at least a couple of times a year to hang out and taste and talk, but this has been in a, you know, a great conversation as always. So thank you very much for the opportunity. We really appreciate it. And it's uh, always fun to have a good conversation with you. And we will be looking forward to see you in Hong Kong or in Napa, wherever, wherever we find each other. But yeah. uh, thank you very much, and appreciate yeah. it. Thank okay. You. La próxima. Thank you, guys. Gracias. Cuídate mucho. Hey, mucho cariño.